All right, welcome to Kirk Spano's Fundamental Trends from sunny, hot Las Vegas, June 15th, 2018. As uh, subscribers, members, and clients know, I am uh, in the desert playing some World Series of Poker and uh, visiting folks, uh, my folks, as well as some friends, having a pretty good time, but working nonetheless a few hours each morning and each night. Uh, and uh, keeping a, an interested eye on the markets. I uh, thought we'd talk about some things uh, for people who are just joining the service or really I think this is a good review for everybody. Um, wrote a little piece in response to a new subscriber question, uh, basically how to get started. And, and, and the answer usually is a little bit different from time to time because we never know right exactly where we are in the world, um, market-wise, economics-wise. So we're gonna cover a few things, but there are some big things that generally stay the same. And the one thing I wanna talk about is really using that core four methodology that we have to build a portfolio. And building a portfolio often comes with uh, something that uh, we don't like to have to do, which is to sell things that we already own uh, because they don't really fit anymore. Uh, but emotionally, it's just difficult to be a seller. One, uh, we don't like to admit we're wrong. Uh, so there's always that pushback that we have uh, with selling something that we had believed that we should be buying. Um, but, but really, uh, that's just the nature of the beast. We have to continually work on our emotional self-control. Uh, we always have to evaluate things in the moment, you know, and look forward as well. So let's start with uh, some very basic things to do when you're trying to build a portfolio. And that first thing is to embrace the changing world. We know uh, that there's big secular trends that are bringing the future to us. And we need to accept those trends uh, whether we like them or not sometimes. And we can try to position ourselves for the growth that is coming in the economy, for the creative destruction that is out there. And, and we need to know that these forces never end. There will always be change. It is the one thing that is constant. And if we can embrace that change, uh, then we're going to do pretty well. Um, it, it's, it's similar to a concept in poker, which is embrace the variance, which means that you have to know that some things will not always go your way. Uh, but in general, if you make good decisions, things will work out. So by looking at what's changing in the world, again, whether we like it or not, uh, we can get on the right side of some big, big trends. And we can get away from um, the trends that are going to work against us and work against the economy, or that are just going to change in a way that don't yield profits for the companies that we would be invested in. So I'm going to go through a handful of scenarios, uh, but the first thing is you need to accept these trends. The biggest trend, of course, is that technology changes everything, and this isn't any different today than it was 100 years ago. Uh, it's just different technology different things that are changing. So during the industrial revolution, that really was technology driven. It wasn't a supercomputer or a semiconductor, uh, but it was a change in technology uh, with the locomotive, uh, eventually with cars, uh, the use of coal for power, uh, lighting. It's just the way that things change. So if we can look at today's change, um, you know, in a way that uh, doesn't scare us and look at it backwards for a moment and just say, well, you know, the world changed from horse and buggy to cars. The world changed from candles to light bulbs. The world changed from telegraph to telephone. Today's changes are just evolutions and all of those other things that humanity has been doing forever, which is to improve what we already use. And if we can invest in the improvements um, and get away from the things that are going to be replaced or changed in a way that reduces profit margin, uh, then we can do very, very well. 
So let's embrace the changes in the economy. Let's embrace the changes in uh, investing. And if we can do that, uh, those big secular trends will be tailwinds for us, even if they're uncomfortable, because change can sometimes be uncomfortable. Um, you know, a point that I would make, <clears throat> you know, some of the angst that comes from change uh, has to do with uh, the changes in the labor force, right? Where people work, uh, how much they earn, uh, how many times they have to change jobs. Technology has really been behind about 80% of all job changes, all labor changes. Uh, it's not an immigrant or foreigner induced thing. And, and I want to make this point because the United States uh, is actually at a point right now where we probably need more immigrants uh, to, to help fuel our economy grow. And that's a little bit at odds with what's going on right now. So we need to consider, and this is uh, something that we're going to talk about in a minute, is all the things that could go wrong with the economy. Um, but we need to consider, you know, really what we're doing here. Uh, how do we use uh, technology? How do we use the labor force to uh, continue to expand standard of living, which ultimately is what we all want, right? We all want to uh, pursue happiness. We all want to have our life and liberty. Um, and, and, and it's scary when the world is changing because we don't know if those things are secure, right? We don't know if life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are secure in a world of change. Uh, again, if we embrace the change though and realize that it's just always been happening, although it seems to be happening faster now, uh, then we're gonna do pretty well. So I just did a real quick um, chart here. You know, what are the biggest secular trends? Technology is changing everything in every industry. And there are a lot of trends and subtrends. The smart everything world, which we talked about in an article a week or so ago, uh, which is bringing in the internet of things, blockchain, edge computing, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, quantum computing, smart this, that, and the other thing. Um, climate change, climate change policy. Again, I'm not gonna get too into the politics here. I'm, I am certain that it's happening and that we're impacting the climate. Um, and, and it really doesn't even matter what I think. What, what really matters is that we've got governments all over the world changing policy because of it. We just saw what happened in California. Uh, they're going to mandate uh, solar panels on roofs by sometime in the 2020s on new constructions, which is what I've said all along is that it'll be applied to new constructions. It'll be difficult to uh, tell people with existing structures they have to put solar up because the buildings just may not be set up for it. So new constructions at some point, and, and I'm actually advising a uh, architecture firm in the Milwaukee area. I told him two, three years ago, hey, you gotta get ready for this because it's coming. He hasn't yet, um, but I think that maybe I could talk to him about what's going on in California because I'd say three, four, eight-ish years on the outside, um, you're going to see laws across America change, and it probably would even be a federal law uh, that every uh, structure uh, that is built would have to have some sort of solar power. Um, I believe that um, they will probably uh, have all sorts of exceptions and special rules, but in general, you're going to see mandated uh, solar energy at some point, mainly because it's becoming so cheap. Uh, and, and it doesn't really uh, cost somebody a lot more lifetime on a structure uh, to have the solar. In fact, it's usually very profitable after several years now. Um, another massive trend is going to be government debts. And <clears throat> I've just thrown this out there a couple of times uh, because it will impact fiscal policy and monetary policy. Eventually, the next financial crisis will hit. It always does. Um, I don't think it's likely to happen in the next decade. Um, but there is a chance that in 2020, we get a recession that morphs into a crisis. I hope not. Uh, but if it does, it'll be something international in nature. Uh, Japan perhaps is the one that I keep talking about. Uh, I do think that there'll be a catalyst for the next recession. Uh, there's the possibility that the Chinese banks uh, finally feel some pressure. Uh, but I think the reality in China is that you're gonna see a shifting of capital 
rather than a, a destruction of capital. Uh, and what I guess I mean by that is you have a country that is on net uh, debt free. You know, so they have debts at their municipal, city, corporate levels, uh, but the country itself, the, the federal government, is a creditor. So you'll just see the Chinese bailing themselves out the way that we did. Uh, they'll do it with savings versus printing all sorts of money, although they'll probably print money too, um, or issue debt. Uh, but 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 I don't think China is a major, major threat to the world economy at this point. Japan, on the other hand, fourth largest economy, uh, really nothing going for them long term. Uh, so that that could be a problem. All right. So after we embrace the fact that the world changes, that there are massive secular trends that we just always have to be aware of, that we want to try to put on our side, um, you know, if they're positive, uh, and then if they're negative, we want to avoid them, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, we're going to, again, we're going to do pretty well just by being on the right side of the, uh, of the equation. And that reminds me of uh, something that uh, Puggy Pearson uh, Poker Pro uh, won the World Series of Poker back in the early 1970s. Said he said, you know, uh, you, have, you need to know yourself uh, if you want to be a good gambler. And I think that that's important for investing too. Essentially, it comes down to emotional control, which we talk about all the time, uh, which we just talked about. Uh, the second thing is you have to manage your bankroll, and that's important as an investor too. Uh, you need to be aware of what your cash position is. Uh, because that gives you a, a level of safety, uh, because it gives you what's called optionality or the ability to strike when the iron's hot. So if you're holding cash from time to time, and I've been telling people to keep getting back to 25% cash levels after these little runs in the market, um, you know, then when the market drops on a day like today, uh, that you might be able to buy a little something that you wanted. And then the final uh, thing that, to uh, keep in mind from Puggy is uh, know which side of the equation you're on. And in, in gambling, he said know which side of the 60-40 you're on. But, you know, with investing, you don't want 60-40 odds. You want like 90%, 10% odds. Uh, but you do need to know what side of the equation you're on. And to that extent, again, get on the long side of trends that are expanding that are showing growth and then get away from the trends uh, that are showing um, you know destruction that are not showing growth so to that end sell grandpa stocks and that doesn't mean sell every uh, old economy stock or what you think is an old economy stock uh, and, and I give an example right off the top here a lot of people would think of Lockheed Martin as an old economy stop, uh, stock but I don't think that it is uh, it really is a great uh, technology company they have quite a few things uh, that, you know, uh, are, are going to be on the right side of the economy for, for decades, literally decades. Uh, Lockheed Martin might end up being one of the major companies in water desalination, which I'm in the desert right now, and I'm seeing what's going on with water. Um, you know, we were just on the Colorado River uh, down in Laughlin. Uh, we went to Lake Havasu. Uh, I wouldn't recommend going unless you have a boat. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's going to be major problems at some point with water. And Lockheed Martin could be on the right side of that. You know, we think of them as a defense contractor. But really, if you go to their web page and you study them, they really have a lot going on. Here's the problem with Lockheed Martin right now. The stock is super expensive. So I'm not buying it. Um, I recommended it a couple of years ago, and in fact, I don't even know who owns it among members and subscribers. If you own Lockheed Martin right now, I, you know I'd be selling covered calls, taking some of that profit off the board, uh, especially if it's in an IRA. Uh, you could even sell, you know, a, a fraction of your shares, uh, twenty, thirty percent. Um, but you know, understand what is and isn't an old economy stock, and uh, don't get tricked. I guess is the point there. You know, there's other companies out there like uh, Procter & Gamble, clearly an old economy stock. 
Uh, I did trade it recently profitably uh, because I didn't think there was really much downside and it looked like it was ready for a bounce. I don't think Procter & Gamble is something I want to hold long-term though. Secular trends are negative um, from the standpoint that their, their ability to grow uh, just isn't there anymore, uh, especially with some competition. So, uh, you know, Procter & Gamble, they're gonna probably do some strategic things that should unlock some value. Uh, but that'll be a one-off. Uh, so I would take a look at Procter & Gamble, you know, really as a trading opportunity, but not a buy and hold forever stock, which, you know, your dividend growth investors will say, oh, buy it and own it forever. Well, I guess if you're comfortable averaging seven, eight, nine, ten percent 10% per year, uh, you can do that sort of thing. Uh, just understand that there's gonna be a year where you lose a third or maybe half of your money if you're just gonna set it and forget it. And that's a lesson that I think we've been learning is that set it and forget it doesn't exist. Uh, that's one of the things that Kramer has right. Uh, but, you know, we really want to uh, understand that, uh, you know, we, we do need to be somewhat actively managing our money, even though uh, I am not a frequent trader, uh, but I do want to, you know, tweak the portfolio, take a little profit here and there, partial position trading. Um, you know, trading uh, out of things from time to time or selling covered calls uh, because adding that cash to the bottom line, again, it improves safety and it gives you optionality, optionality to um, invest when bad things happen. It's always good to have a good plump checkbook when people are selling things cheap would be the point. And in the next couple of years, that will probably happen. And we'll talk about all the reasons that could happen here as soon as we're done with this. And, and go ahead and put questions up. I'll, I'll glance back at the chat here, here and there. Um, you know, something that is clearly old economy is, uh, is deep water offshore drilling. Um, the deep water in particular, um, because that's expensive oil. And, you know, even if they can get it out of uh, the, the uh, bottom of the ocean floor at $50 per barrel, uh, once they've already built a project, uh, you have to realize that they might be billions of dollars into the project uh, before they get that first $50 barrel of oil. So how many $50 barrels of oil do you need at selling them at say 65 or 70 or 80 uh, to make back your billions of dollars of initial capital investment? That's why we have to be very careful of thinking um, that the offshore drillers are gonna have some major rebound. They probably aren't. I would say that most of them are doomed. Uh, I have written about that extensively. And we are, we are seeing specifically over at uh, IHS Market that day rates are not, are not doing well, right? So if you take a look at what's going on, Day rates for rigs have not rebounded. A little bit here in Europe, way down from the $180 an hour or $180,000 um, uh, per day, per hour, good grief. You know, look at those trends, a little bit of a rebound there, but not much, not nearly where it was. This is all margin compression, right? It's all money these companies, these drillers don't make anymore. A little bit of rebound off the bottom, still not near where it was. Look, not even close. So the offshore drillers, that's a major secular trend working against you. And uh, I'm gonna short those companies again soon. I don't know when, probably 2020, early 2020 maybe, uh, but there's a time when we're gonna short Ensco and Diamond Offshore and Noble, Transocean. We'll figure out which one or two or three to short, or maybe we'll, we'll short a group uh, to spread our risk a bit. Uh, but these offshore drillers are doomed. They're all going to zero, uh, would be the easy way to say it. Of course, they won't all go to zero, uh, but a lot of them are gonna lose money. Uh, their, their share prices are going to drop. Uh, there's, they're still killing rigs. Uh, there's just not demand out there for it. So we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute, why there isn't demand. 
this article, by the way, I'm going through is exclusively for members right now. It should be out to the public here soon um, with a couple of things that uh, are missing a few things. Uh, Caterpillar, you know, people love Caterpillar because it's been going up. But again, take it, tell me where their revenue growth is. It's just range bound, it's cyclical, right? So Caterpillar has, should have had this one up because, you know, Caterpillar is a company that I want to do well because they have a lot of jobs in the Milwaukee area. You know, I'm not, I'm not anti-caterpillar by any stretch of the imagination. But look at this chart. You know, look at a 10-year chart. Right? Look at that. Here. Now let's look at it. Tell me. Tell me. Does the right-hand edge of that chart... Oh, I'm having a heart. There we go. Does the right-hand edge of this chart look like a normal chart? No, that's not right. This area in here is right-ish. But Caterpillar probably going to get back to $100 a share. When? I don't know. Next recession, bam. If that next recession is a year off or two years off or three years off, Right, you want to be selling into the strength. Could you speculate on one more speculative run up? Sure, uh, but if you're that good of a trader, you're not listening to this show. Um, but this is an area where you're going to start to see some breakdown, even if you get one more spike, uh, say to 160, 170. Uh, I'm a seller of Caterpillar. Uh, it's just there's no cyclical growth or no secular growth to it. It's a cyclical stock. The cycle is high right now, and it's about to turn over. Looks like it's about to turn over. Doesn't mean it can't jitterbug up, but you know you're close to the top there. You should be scaling out. You know this is something that I've written a little bit about. Uh, I'm I'm probably going to fire out a ton of articles going into the election uh, because I think the politicians are going to jump all over healthcare. Bottom line is that the governments of the world, in particular the United States, cannot afford for healthcare to keep getting more expensive and taking more of the economy. They are going to try to control that from Congress. There's already bills pending. Uh, ultimately, you're going to see stocks that did well under Obamacare get crushed. United Healthcare, uh, to me, is the one that is uh, gonna get crushed the most. Uh, but there's others. So expect government to uh, try to rein in healthcare. And that means massive margin compression. It means price controls. Uh, it means squeezing out the profitability of a lot of companies. And it probably means Medicare for all. Uh, I would be shocked if in the next uh, seven or eight years uh, that doesn't finally get passed. And it probably would be the best thing in the world um, for everybody as we go into a world where uh, employment uh, is going to be uh, very challenged to be the primary um, healthcare benefit uh, provider. And something else to consider is that corporations would love to get out of providing health insurance, right? So. In a world where corporations wield enormous power, and you know people may not know this, but one of President Trump's closest um, consultants, unofficial consultants, the guy who runs uh, Newsmax, I believe it's Newsmax, um, he has said we should just have everybody on Medicare, and this is a right wing guy, so it comes from the from the standpoint on the left that we want to have everybody covered for health insurance. Uh, because they look at it as a right. I do as well. Uh, not that that matters um, as an investor. But then also from the right, uh, corporations uh, would like to get out of that expense. So if you get to the point where everybody's on Medicare, which has a level of price control to it and would lend itself to negotiating drug prices, which isn't legal now, but President Trump's already talking about, there are all sorts of easy fixes to health insurance. Um, but 
ideologically, uh, the insurance companies have funded and the, and the pharmaceutical companies have funded uh, this fight um, to steer people's ideology and say, well, no, no, free market, more competition is the way to go. That's not really what's happening because healthcare can't ever overcome the monopoly pricing pressure, right? There isn't a substitute for healthcare. So knowing what the real definition of uh, monopoly is, uh, which isn't lots of competitors. It has to do with uh, substitutes. So uh, you can have five giant insurance companies and dozens of little ones, but really they're all, it's just a slice out of the same pie. <coughs> there isn't really much uh, competition uh, given that you can't say, I'd rather not have health insurance. You can, but then you'll go bankrupt as soon as you get sick. So, you know, which which is happening, and that's and that's a major draw on the economy too. So, I think you should expect Medicare for all to happen. I don't know exactly the time frame. I'd say in the next seven or eight years, and that will cause massive changes. In the meantime, you're going to see other things to drive healthcare costs down. And ultimately, I, they're just going to come to the conclusion that Medicare for all is the way to go. And I know that that sets off all sorts of ideological things in people said, oh, you don't believe in free markets, which is just the dumbest thing to say to me uh, because I own three businesses. I'm a stock market guy. You know, I do believe in free markets, but I'm also an economist and I understand that monopoly pricing pressure is bad for capitalism. You know, you have to regulate uh, industries that have the ability through monopoly pricing pressure to gouge you. And that's what is going on in healthcare right now. We're getting gouged. There is no legitimate reason why the per capita healthcare spending in the United States is so much higher than the rest of the developed world. And to say that we have better healthcare than other nations, they're not a statistic in the world that bears that out. We have higher infant mortality. Uh, we have higher levels of drug addiction. You know, the reality is, is that we have a system where there's really three different levels of care for us. The super wealthy can afford the best people. Great. Okay, that's never going to change. The super wealthy always can afford, afford the best stuff. Uh, that's why we should try to become super wealthy. Um, but then you have the broad middle market where they have healthcare expenses uh, that they have to pay for. Uh, between insurance premiums, reduced wages to pay insurance premiums, and then deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays, which stress their family budgets. And then you have insurance for the poor, uh, which basically means you're poor. So while you are getting Medicaid at that point, you know, you really don't have a lot of money for anything else. So we have this system where the super wealthy get the best care. And then across the board, the other 98% of us uh, have, you know, level various levels of care uh, and expense. And it really is just becoming to the point where it's crippling the economy. So if you think that a company like United Healthcare with that chart, under these circumstances, with government that's gonna have to control costs, is gonna keep rising like that, I will take the other side of that bet at some point. Um, right now, I'm just telling people to sell what they have with United Healthcare, reposition the money, hold the cash, whatever. And um, ultimately, when United Healthcare is, you know, hundred seventy-five dollars a share, maybe fifty dollars a share, you know, then people start talking about selling United Healthcare. And you know, you know, why wait until then? You know, sell it now. How to find high ceiling stocks to put into your asset allocation. Again, start by looking within the big positive trends. Uh, in general, you want to invest in more smaller companies. And I'm not talking about startups that are in that speculative phase. I'm talking about 500 million, billion, $2 billion, $5 billion companies that have become profitable or on right at the edge of becoming profitable. Those companies are undercovered they are generally underappreciated by the market. Therefore, you can still get value and you can get a very good growth equation from these smaller companies, as well as a value pricing that 
you know, you can't get on the big stocks because take a look at a company like Amazon. Amazon is priced to perfection. You know, can you really see them tripling or quadrupling over the next decade? I can't. You know, at some point, I think that company even has to break up. Google, another company, which we are invested in Google, um, have been since a little over $1,000 a share again, and I've owned, owned it in the past. I regret having sold it. Uh, this is a company that's going to split up into eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 companies. I don't know. There's going to be a lot of baby Googles. And I've been talking about the baby Googles that are coming. Uh, you want to find ways to own Google. It is not tremendously expensive uh, based on the amount of money they generate. But you should understand that in a world that's starting to finally understand a little bit about privacy rights and how these companies uh, gather information, Facebook being the biggest offender in my opinion, um, you know, there's going to be some challenges for these companies to change to new paradigms that occur as they get regulated or they're told, hey, you know, stop selling your, inf you know, people's information uh, in certain ways. Uh, stop using it in certain ways. You know, that's going to in impact them. But Google uh, has so many divisions from alternative energy to to uh, the fiber to, you know, alternative, uh, excuse me, smart cars that, uh, you know, to edge computing, uh, quantum computing, they have a project. You know, they're going to spin off a lot of these moonshot ideas as they get to the edge of profitability. And when they spin off companies, these are not going to be actually one and two billion dollar companies. Most of the companies they spin off will be S and P 500 components. They'll immediately have the support of the indexers. So, you know, you can you can make money on the right side of the trends with certain companies like Google, um, but really you want to go smaller. And I've talked about some of these companies that are out there. Uh, one of them is Sierra Wireless. And I think that they are probably likely to see a huge jump in uh, business revenue later this year, very late this year or next year. And the price that it's at now, uh, it's at that uh, chopping around area. We love the chopping around area. Right, why do we love the chopping around area? Because it's a spot where we can get a pretty good price. So if we take a look at Sierra Wireless. Take a look at a 10 year chart. Had that nice run up here. And then business correction, a little bit of a run up there. Two gaps. It's kind of neat to see how the gaps fill. And now it's in that choppy area. For the last year, been chopping around. Look at that consolidation. When companies that have growth, and growth outlook, um, start going in that sideways consolidation phase, which can last a while. That's when you have to get really interested. And you know, I've been investing since in here. Um, why? Because I don't know when it's gonna jump up, right? Anybody who, who's gonna try to tell you to time it perfectly, you know, they don't really, uh, they're not really helping you out. So, You know, sometimes you just have to bear and grin it. Uh, right now though, that's, you know, I bought before this little dip down. I've sold some puts, which I think are a great thing to do. I'm gonna end up with a cost basis on Sierra Wireless between 15 and 17 and a half. This is a stock that could go all the way into the 30s pretty easily. Uh, they are an IOT company. You know, read some of the articles uh, if you subscribe to me. Uh, there's an interview out there as well. What are some other companies that have the right trends on their side? Well, surprisingly, AT&T. And the Time Warner deal just went through. I'm going to write an article about their earnings and I'm sure somebody will beat me to it. But the earnings that are going to occur at AT&T just from the uh, emerging the companies initially is, is going to yield synergies. Uh, that'll drive earnings. Uh, but also over time, you're gonna see the cross uh, selling, the cross marketing opportunities. 
So AT&T's uh, earnings per share probably is gonna jump pretty substantially uh, a couple of years out. Now, do they have major expenses with the 5G build out? Certainly. Um, are they gonna have to find a way to integrate the company? Uh, certainly. And, and I don't think they're gonna have as big a problem as you know all the bears would say, uh, but the bears are just on a trend trade right now, trying to beat it down one last piece. Um, and and at and could drop more, it could. But if you take a look at where they are as well, you know, they've been, you know, pretty much range bound for a really long time. Let's uh, go back to, Nineteen ninety eight. Let's look at the last twenty years. How's that for range bound? So it's closing in on the bottom of its range, and it could get down to crisis pricing in the twenties. It could mid twenties, uh, in which case we'd buy a ton more. Uh, but this is a stock that's going to chop along sideways no matter what. So not a lot of risk to buy it here. But when you take a look at their growth catalysts the consolidation in the content and content delivery spaces. This is a company along with Comcast that could do very, very well. And I think you could see it break out of this trading range, get to the middle 50s, and then have a whole new trading range for the next 20 years, uh, say between 55 and 75. So the money that we're looking to make here not it isn't just the 6% dividend, which is nice, uh, given that I don't think there's much downside, uh, but the possibility that we go to 55-ish, at that point, you have to consider, do you want to try to ride it to the top of a new trading range, or do you think they're going to be at the top of a trading range when it gets to, you know, in the mid-50s? You know, that'll be a decision for them. But I think that you can make $15, $20 a share on this plus the dividend, over the next several years. And that qualifies as our double. Um, and then we have that chance for a triple if it breaks into the new trading range. Calix, Calix, I still don't know how to say it. Um, they have deals with CenturyLink and Verizon to help them build out uh, their 5G uh, technology. And they're a little company. Uh, they've been chopping around as well. This is not going to be in the article on the free side of Seeking Alpha, so you have to see it here. Unless you're a member. Oh, that looks like Sierra Wireless. Oh, it is Cal wow. Look how similar that chart is to Sierra Wireless. Oh, I didn't know that. Pretty interesting, huh? So we've been buying in this area. So most people should be up on that. You know, around eight bucks a share right now. Uh, my cost basis is under seven. I think a lot of people have a cost basis under seven. So this one's nice. And you can see that it could break out. What could it break out on? Well, if you've been paying attention, um, we know that they could have major revenue increases later this year. Uh, they had a business transition, much like Sierra Wireless did. Uh, and now they're getting to the point where money is dropping to the bottom line. Uh, some other trends here, I'm going to finish on solar energy, uh, but some other trends, uh, again, this one's going to be impacted by major secular trends is Nutrien. Uh, Nutrien just divested their uh, SQM holdings, which was lithium, and I, I forget what it is, $4.6 billion to the bottom line for that uh, divestiture. The stock has started to rise, as I said that it would, and it's paying a dividend. And then the kicker, the kicker with Nutrien is this, is that there is a developing tightness in the potash market uh, that's been going on for a couple of years now uh, because the potash suppliers have not been uh, spending a lot of money on bringing new potash to the market. Why? Because the market was against them a few years back when the Russians and Uricali, um you know, engaged in some, you know, production that wasn't expected. And, you know, the cycles just were working against them. You had BHP Billiton talking about adding potash production because everybody knew that potash was going to be important in the very long term. The problem is that they were at the bottom of a cycle 
and a lot of those companies got wiped out. Intrepid Potash is what, four bucks a share right now? Three, might be less. I don't even know, I haven't looked at them in a while. And Oops, that was wrong. Intrepid Potash. This will be a horrible chart. You know, look at that one. You know, last 10 years. How's that for falling off a cliff? 70, and now it's four. Uh, I don't even know what their what their outlook is. And my guess is they get bought by somebody. They only have the one mine or two mines, maybe. Um, so you take a look at Nutrien, and why do you like them? Because they actually have monopoly pricing on their side. Okay. So while we don't want monopoly pricing in health insurance because that materially affects our cost of living and the ability to run the government, um, <clears throat> you know, without running major deficits. Uh, the fertilizer market is largely controlled by about a half a dozen companies globally, you know, a couple in uh, uh, Ukraine and Russia, and uh, one in Europe, a couple of uh, companies in uh, South America, and then you have the Canadian, um, used to be three companies, Mosaic, Agrium, and Potash, you know, Agrium and Potash have merged, so you really have Nutrien, which is Agrium and Potash merged, and Mosaic, uh, and then you have CF Industries, you know, really controlling the entire uh, fertilizer market on the globe. You know, what they have done pretty much as a group over the last several years is not spent a lot of money developing new resources. What happens when you don't develop new resources but demand slowly goes up is eventually you get tightness in that market. And then you get a period where margins really expand, which is what's going on with Nutrien. So not only did they just have four or five billion dollars dropped to the, to the bottom line, uh, but they're seeing their margins slowly increase. They have major synergies uh, with Agrium, which was largely a vertical merger, much like the AT&T um, Time Warner deal, um, because Agrium has this incredible uh, sales uh, structure and uh, retail structure that they're now utilizing to generate all sorts of uh, sales globally. So Nutrien is a stock that I think this could break the all-time highs. I think it's about to do it uh, when you adjust for where they were as Agrium and, 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 and Potash. To me, this is a $100 stock. I've been saying that, you know, as it floated around 50 uh, and it's gonna pay increasing dividends over time. So to me, this is a real dividend growth investment. And if you're, if you're a retiree and you're looking for a company that's going to give you a great total return doesn't have a ton of downside. And why doesn't it have a ton of downside? Because they don't have a lot of competition and fertilizer is required for food, especially in a world where climate change, whether we cause it or not, is killing uh, about 5% of the arable land on the planet every year. Think about that. In 20, 30 years, um, unless we really maintain our land, I mean, it could just disappear because it, it, it's shrinking, arable land is shrinking. So, you know, it's going to require all sorts of maintenance to keep the arable land from disappearing. Finally, let's talk about sun power since I'm in the desert. Uh, I stopped by the um, uh, solar power plant in Henderson. Uh, we were just driving by and uh, I hadn't planned to do it, but we saw it, so we took some pictures. Um, have been reading some of the news about solar here in Nevada. We all know about what's going on in California. Solar is a major, major trend, and it's going to keep getting added to the power mix uh, to the point where I believe it will reach about 50% of all electric generation in the 2040s, by the 2040s, maybe 2030s, but probably 2040s. You know, it's a 20, 25, 30 year process. But of course, we're growing from numbers that are super small. A couple of years ago, it was a fraction of a percent. Now it's a couple percent, and that's just going to keep ramping up. Sun power in an industry that is consolidated and seen a lot of companies go out of business is one of the strongest competitors out there. Total is their patron. And so this is a company that is not just going to poof go away because Total is backing it knowing that this is part of Total's future as the end of the oil age and the end of the coal age um, and eventually the end of the natural gas age although that's way off uh, but coal is going to go away and, and and natural gas excuse me oil will eventually go away and companies like SunPower are going to do very well and there's a lot of reasons 
a lot of catalysts here that will drive that. When you take a look at electric vehicles, the electricity has to come from somewhere. It's going to come from solar. Tesla, Elon Musk, they have that equation right. Whether that company happens to be able to make us money from this point or not is hard to know. But the general equation that as electricity demand goes up, solar use will go up. I think that's a very direct correlation and it will continue to go. Right now, about half of all new solar, excuse me, electric generation does come from solar. So that's a big deal. As electricity generation uh, demand goes up, it'll come from solar. California is going to drive that market largely. But I think Nevada and Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, all these southern states are going to jump on because it's just incredibly efficient with the price of solar components coming down and the price of natural gas and coal and oil drifting up long term, even if they're subdued right now. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that coal, I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, this is a solar, so this is one of our uh, subscribers posted this. You know, the Nellis Air Force Base has a big solar array. Um, where is this article? Right here. All right. So there is a new technology. Not, not really a new technology. It's an old technology that somebody improved. Much like the methane capture that New Light Technologies is doing. Private company, been looking to find a way to invest in them backdoor. Can't find it. But there's a company called uh, New Light Technologies that they can convert methane into plastic. That's going to be a big deal to the petrochemical industry, right? Because they get 70, 80% of their money from plastics. So uh, there's some major disruption there. Uh, and, and as you see companies investing in petrochemicals, you really should ask yourself a question. Is that right for technological change? And the answer is yes. One of the largest petrochemical companies down in Houston, a private entity, uh, already bought um, a huge um, production or got into a huge production agreement with uh, New Light Technology over the next 10 years. So it was a billion dollar deal for a little teeny tiny private startup. And uh, the same thing is going to happen with coal is there is a uh, process that's existed for a long time, but somebody figured out a way to make it super cheap and to essentially um, run in a way that is going to contribute to coal plants getting just wiped out. Uh, and it's not necessarily going to, you know, coal power plants could be wiped out due to legislation, but it's probably going to be technology, right? There's enough pressure from the legislation um, to, to spur this type of innovation. So there's a new ca carbon catcher, capture and they tried it with coal and it failed but they're doing it with natural gas and that works. So they're at 13 or 14 or 15 percent more expensive than a regular natural gas plant, but it ends up being almost carbon neutral. So this is the sort of technology that we have to watch because if this really works, it'll, it'll probably just wipe out coal almost overnight within five years. So that's another place where if you're trying to put money in coal, like deep water, like some of the other things that I've talked about, you're just on the wrong side of the big trend. So get on the right side of the big trend. Um, understand that there's multiple reasons why coal will get wiped out. It's not just legislation, it's technology, whether it's solar or different types of carbon capture that apply to natural gas. All right, just gonna touch on oil here real quick because um, we've been big on the oil trade. You know, oilprice.com <clears throat> has some good free articles. I, I'm a premium subscriber, so you know, I end up uh, giving a little bit more detailed analysis than uh, what's on the free side of anything. But, uh, you know, the, the bearish case for oil, going back to say $60 a barrel, is that you're going to have the non OPEC producers um, increase production a lot more over the next year or two. I have contended that's not true for a couple of reasons. One, I think they're smarter than that. And two, there are constraints on transportation. Now we find out that Continental Resources, Pioneer, and Hess, three of the biggest ship producers, are talking to OPEC about how to better control oil supply.
imagine that. They're not that dumb after all. So again, this is a market that are trying to create monopoly pricing pressure. And, and President Trump kind of has a point. There's plenty of oil out there right now. Um, prices could be $40 a barrel, uh, but they're controlling that market. So you just have to understand, you know, people will do what's in their best interest and what's in their best interest is not to let oil drop under 60 again and really to keep it around 80. So that's why I have said the Goldilocks price of oil is around 80 and all these players are going to manage it to be there. And, and that's why shocks won't be all that pronounced because they have the ability to ramp up production within several months if there really is a dramatic shock. Let's suppose there was a war in the Middle East that took 2 million barrels or 3 million barrels a day off between Saudi Arabia and shale and Russia. They could add it back in well within a year. And in that time period, you'd still just be going through inventory and then strategic petroleum reserves. So there really isn't this likelihood that you're going to see 150 or $200 barrel oil. You know, could it spike for a minute? I, I guess just because markets go crazy. Uh, but I think the reality is that we're going to get that Goldilocks price of oil around 80-ish, 70, 80, 90 from time to time, but 80-ish. And that's going to be remarkably profitable for the best shale players, for the companies that uh, do actually have marginal prices of oil um, in the 30s and 40s. So we already saw a lot of them go cash flow positive at $50 barrel of oil. And now they're finally realizing higher higher uh, 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 prices. Now, certain companies though have hedged too much and we need to be aware of that. And I won't, I shouldn't say too much. Um, there's a chart out in one of these uh, articles that I'd love to find again. It's a, it's a Wood McKenzie article. And they have a chart that shows all the companies and how much they've hedged. I've actually published it. I just don't know where I published it. Um, but the companies that haven't hedged a lot are companies like Continental and Whiting. So even though they're not really Permian producers, they're not Permian producers, um, because they didn't hedge, they're really getting the benefit of these higher oil prices. And they've probably hedged more recently at the higher oil prices. So companies like Continental and Whiting probably do pretty well at the bottom line. And the question becomes, are they priced to buy? Well, let's take a look. You know, Whiting, excuse me, Continental was way up here over 70, you know, around 80 crashed and now it's back up to 65. Do they have upside into the 80s for sure? Do they have upside into the hundreds? They might because from a marginal standpoint, they were producing all that Bakken oil and a couple other places. Um, they're gonna see their cash flows really go up because they waited to lock in prices. So they don't have much of their oil in the 50s. They're really getting in the 60s. And that's going to drop huge money to their bottom lines. This is a trade that you could probably do pretty well with. Same thing with Whiting. Same story. Even though it's not super cheap right now, the trend is your friend and margins are going to expand. Money's going to drop to the bottom line. Whiting, same deal. Whiting might be even a bigger bargain. So we should really we should really explore Whiting, I would think. Uh, maybe they're a company that could run back to 150, right? That seems to be a pretty good plateau. You know, let's take a look at Whiting. So I will put that out to the members of the uh, gallery. Take a look at Whiting, start doing a little research there. Maybe this is a company that's going to see a big drop down in revenue to the bottom line. All right, let's get to questions. Oh, one last thing. U.S. sanctions, trade, all this other stuff. That's a long, long discussion. Don't have time for it now. Um, but South Korea, less oil imports from Iran. Ah, 
It's going to keep happening. And if Iran starts talking about nuclear weapons or nuclear project uh, programs again, then the UN will sanction them. And then com countries like India, who said that they'll only uh, stop taking Iranian oil if the UN gets involved, not just the U.S. You know, they could. Uh, you know, you could really, you could really see that market contract. Saudi Arabia talking about raising oil prices to uh, raising oil prices to Asia. Again, this is all part of the maintenance of the oil market. All right, let's take a look at the chat here. We were talking about the weather. I mean, it's, it was like 113 degrees here uh, in Henderson when we were at that power plant. All right. Yep, there, somebody mentioned um, uh, LMT, uh, Lockheed Martin, which I started the, the program with. Yeah, great, all sorts of great stuff, but utility scale, battery technology, yeah, absolutely. If there is a big stock market correction, Lockheed Martin is at the top of my list of, to buy. It's right there with Google. Uh, so for large cap stocks, if I could get Lockheed Martin again, and hold it for, uh, you know, through a whole economic cycle, six, seven, eight years, I would do it. I just, I haven't uh, done it. Your video is on. What, you guys can see me? Well, that's not good at all. Oh, well, here, we'll fix that. We'll, we'll put some sunglasses on you. There you go. Very rare that my video is on, so. All right, China is using savings to bail out banks. You know, like equals bail insurance. Like, so, well, not exactly. China's got plenty of money. Netflix impact games. GameStop. Yeah, GameStop. That's the next. They have to. You know, here's the thing with com countries that uh, have to go through a train or companies have to go through a transition. Sometimes those transitions fail. So you don't want to put 30% of your money in GameStop, right? It's a one, 2% holding. And, um, you know, if they turn it around, the stock will go through the roof on the subscriptions. And if they don't turn it around because the management screws up, we'll figure it out soon enough and we'll lose 20 or 30% and then we'll move on. I love AT&T right here. And I would love it more if it goes into the 20s. Um, I haven't studied Acadia Pharma lately. So that's something where you got to catch up on all the reports. Uh, reversal in healthcare stocks. Uh, that's political in nature. So um, I would think that uh, it's coming soon with the midterms, uh, but really in the 2020s. Um, but you want to be ahead of that. 2020s aren't that far away. Uh, I like the merger. Earnings are going to go higher. Oh, everybody's asking about at and I guess I should write a whole article about this. Um, growth is going to come from 5G. If you are not using the super fast internet, which usually most people only get it at work, um, I'll tell you what. I unplugged back in January or so, and I'm just using Amazon Prime, um, a Fire Stick, and some add-ons and DirecTV Now. And DirecTV Now for 35 bucks is a great deal to get all your basic stations and it's convenience, right? You can get a lot of stuff using other services, but DirecTV Now to me is an awesome, awesome service. And now that they own eight, uh, Time Warner, uh, their ability to, to package content in-house is going to be pretty um, pretty impressive. So uh, they're going to get growth from selling package deals, cross-marketing, and the 5G is going to be a big deal. AT&T, Verizon are going to be the leaders in that. Um, and I think they're going to make a ton of money. And you're going to see more consolidation in the space. I still think CenturyLink is a takeover target. To me, it makes a ton of sense that Google buys them. So we'll see what happens there. Um, should we buy SolarEdge today? <sighs> Let's take a look. It's 
come down, right? It's come down somewhat. Yeah, you know what? It's not horrible. I won't say yes or no, but because I'm I haven't like I said, I haven't looked directly at it lately. But will that gap fill? You could start scaling in here. Selling puts here wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't think it's going to get below its 200-day moving average unless we have a correlated event. Yeah, yeah you could start nibbling very smallly on Solar Edge. I, I like the sol selling uh, selling puts idea best. Um, I think Anthem's a better company than United Healthcare from the standpoint of ethics, but United Healthcare makes more money, so. I think Anthem gets majorly impacted too. Now, here's something to keep in mind. Once we put the squeeze on healthcare, probably through Medicare for all, <coughs> you're going to have several companies become major Medicare supplement sale sellers. And um, United Healthcare and Anthem are leaders in that. So Medicare plus a Medicare supplement, I think that's the future. I, I've sold Medicare supplements, it's how I started my career. It's a great system. You don't hear old people say, take away my Medicare and Medicare supplement. Um, they're going to keep doing well. Uh, for solar, I like for solar, it's getting close to the buy price again. Sold out of Facebook. I think that's probably a good idea. Um, Double position, I mean like six to eight percent. No, I wouldn't put six to eight percent of my money in AT and T. There's really nothing that I, I would put six to eight percent of my money in right now, other than Google. Um, it doesn't matter which share class you own; uh, they're all going to convert eventually anyway. I don't think Time Warner uh, shareholders are going to sell much of their AT and T. Any quick thoughts on oil? Yeah, I gave it to you. It's going to be Goldilocks. Has hedging become a cap on profits with WTI? For some companies, yes. For some companies, no. Just talked about the hedging. Um, was McDermott own some of that? Yeah, they, they have some of that. Some of the technology or they're running it. I, I just read the article. I just discovered that today uh, because I was looking for it. I knew that it was out there somewhere because I had heard about it. Uh, so I just glanced at that article. Uh, moving to, again, uh, WTI is going to be around 80-ish. A little, little below Brent, but 80-ish. Uh, and it's going to hold for a long time. That's the peak oil plateau. Occidental, again, wildly profitable. Just going to keep dropping revenue and uh, margin to the bottom line. When you refer to a position presenters in a name, are you referring to a percentage of overall portfolio or percentage of the portion dedicated to tactical holdings? Uh, overall percentage of the portfolio. So let's suppose you break up your portfolio into two parts, core and tactical, which is fine. The core I'm usually looking at being um, ETFs and then tactical being stocks. So, you know, your core position in energy would be XOP, uh, in technology could be XSD, uh, and then you would own, uh, say, Pioneer Energy and Micron on that tactical side. So it still ends up being a percentage of the total portfolio. Um, so, I, you know, I, like I said, I'm not usually going to have more than two, three, four percent in any one stock. Uh, Google at the moment is the one example where I could, I don't, but I could. Um, USOU down 10% today, so that means that uh, um, oil got crushed at some point, apparently. Uh, what, what happened to US? Uh, what do I want here? I want WTI spot. Sixty-six ten. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know, I'll have to take a look at that. Oh, Kevin Bogart's video, ah, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw him earlier too. <laughs> hey Kev. 
um, Zora, Z U O. Don't, now we'll, we'll take a look at that too. That's an IPO. Can you get, look at Acadia chart? Uh, sure. ACAD. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, talk about Acadia, right? Choppy as heck. So the question becomes, there's a gap way back here. Can it go even further down into the teens? It could. This is a company where we have to study the fundamentals, right? What are the catalysts for upside? You don't just buy based on the chart, but we are getting a double bottom here, triple bottom really. So, you know, you've got this, this, and this over a pretty long period of time, several years. So this is, this is a spot where we should be studying Acadia. What are their catalysts to increase revenue? And is that revenue gonna have good margin? Regeneron, yeah, you know, I've just, it's, I just keep waiting because there doesn't seem to be any reason why it would start to really rebound. But it's starting to do that little jitterbug thing, right? So if we get some sideways movement, and that would be when the, the, the coil compresses and then we can start investing in it at some point if we like the fundamental catalysts. Because the long-term trend is on the side of biotech companies that can save the government and healthcare system money, right? You know, diagnostics companies like Exact Sciences, um, companies that can, can compete with an expensive pharmaceutical you know, by providing us a cheaper solution, uh, companies that can create treatments that are less invasive and less costly than existing treatments. All right. So I think that's where we're at today. That was a solid hour. Didn't feel like a solid hour. I didn't get too hyper. Um, Las Vegas has subdued me a little bit. As folks uh, who have been following on the uh, chat board over at uh, margin of safety, and I'll put something up on fundamental trends this weekend. Uh, I did win a poker tournament yesterday, not a big one, uh, over at the Flamingo. If you are learning how to play poker uh, or just an average player, I would say go to the Flamingo. It's a pretty good room, and uh, they, uh, you know, are not attracting a lot of the high-end players. should think about that from a, uh, a tactical standpoint. When do you, uh, oh, it looks like my internet's a little unstable. Uh, when do you buy and sell? And you should think of that as when do you play a hand? And in poker, you fold 80 to 90% of the time. Well, I've told you in investing, 80 to 90% of the stocks out there just aren't investable. So we have to look at a lot of, you know, a lot of ideas. We have to turn over a lot of rocks before we find something that we want. And, you know, the very short list plus the Dow stocks and some of the international stocks, what we have, we're covering about 150 stocks out of 5,000. You know, and these are, you know, and I'm sure there's several dozen more that would meet my screening. Um, and we'll add those over time. Uh, but the reality is, is that most of the stocks in the stock market are not investable. They don't have growth or they have bad financials or they have bad management. You know, there, there's something out there. So we want good management, good financials and growth. We want some of these companies to be paying it income through dividends. That's usually a good sign that they're going to remain profitable. Uh, but then, you know, by the way, make sure that there's no financial engineering that's keeping them paying the dividend. And that actually is happening to a lot of companies in the S&P 500. Without the financial engineering, they'd be in bad shape. So between interest rates going up now and a recession eventually coming, there's going to be a lot of pain in the dividend payers at some point. And you're gonna really have to ask yourself, do I wanna be in a dividend payer because it's paying five or 6% if it's not going to grow? 
The answer is going to be no, especially if they're high debt. So keep that in mind and, um, you know, don't get caught in any value traps. Uh, beyond that, uh, I, I do just want to say something in passing. I was sitting at the poker table last night with a woman from Canada. Um, she has something to do with business development. I gave her my name. We're going to try to get in contact with each other. And we talked a little bit about the tariffs. And I'll tell you, she clearly threw off a vibe where, you know, they're, they're irritated with America for doing the tariffs. Something I, I've written about, and I'm going to tell you one more time. The United States has lower tariffs than virtually every other country out there. So if we're raising our tariffs as a way of telling other countries to lower theirs so that we can put ours back, maybe it's them. Maybe they're the ones that need to be less protectionist. And, and that's important to consider. However, there can be major unintended consequences. What could those unintended, unintended consequences be? You could have Europeans or even the Canadians or Mexicans, but probably the Europeans get very, very stubborn. And they won't look at things based on apples to apples. They'll just say, well, you raised your tariffs, so we're going to raise our tariffs. We have to fight back. But the reality is that their tariffs were way higher than ours in the first place. So maybe prodding them is the right thing to do because freer markets are better for the world as long as you know you don't have gouging and 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 money concentrated into very few hands to that end you have to have proper tax policy and proper regulation but lowering tariffs is generally good raising tariffs is generally bad we need to keep an eye on this just in case all right with that i will tell you have a good day um, I think that you should take a look at those uh, stocks in the article. Uh, it should be out to the public soon. Uh, but uh, Sun Power, I tell you, that's going to end up being one of my biggest positions, I think. I, I look at it the same way that I looked at Exact Sciences a decade ago, and uh, I'm happy that I made a thousand percent on Exact Sciences. I think I might, I think I might end up making a thousand percent on Sun Power as well. Have a good weekend.